Okay, so it's time okay. to start. Let me, let me introduce uh, Federico here, our last speaker for the uh, room after a long weekend that you have been uh, getting all this knowledge from open source projects and free software projects. Probably you are a little bit tired now. I was lucky to be also in the program committee of this uh, year, and we selected specifically Federico to be here because we know that he has good energy and very interesting topics to close up our room. So um, Federico is probably going to be able to deliver our very last talk in a very good way. He used to live in the UK, but before Brexit, he realized he had some enlightening conditions that I would go back to my home country. So directly from Italy, please welcome Federico Cantoli. Thank you very much. So, yes, my name is Federico, live in Italy, and yeah, uh, today, this is the last uh, talk of the day, we will have uh, some sort of uh, stories, rather technical stuff, so uh, it will keep you uh, awake, because it has been a very tiring uh, weekend, as the FOSDEM normally is. So, little word about myself. This is my lovely cat, Ozzy. Uh, this is me. It's better the cat is on the front because it's cutier, cutier so it's much better in this way. I was born in 1972. I look younger, but as my girlfriend says, I am a time lord. I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who, so uh, that's the reason why uh, I don't look old, but I'm really, really old in my opinion. Uh, I started with the IT in 1982 with the Tron movie, an amazing movie. And I joined the Oracle Secret, Oracle DBA Secret Society in 2004. This is the, the way I like to describe my, that period of my life, is, uh, is like being part of the Secret Society for sure. In 2006, I discovered this crazy database. At that time, it was the 7.4. It was a massive bet for me. And it's a bet I, I believe I won, because now Postgres has been uh, constantly, it's gaining momentum, it's becoming something amazing. It's still amazing. And like Devrim, I have a Postgres tattoo <laughs> on my left shoulder. So, uh, <laughs> woo! <laughs> so I'm really committed to Postgres. Uh, I work as freelance DevOps and data engineer in the meantime when I, I'm not at the conferences. Uh, those are my contacts. Uh, technical blog, I write stuff about Postgres. This is my Twitter, so if you want to uh, follow me, uh, very happy to, to get that. And this is my GitHub page where I have a couple of in interesting projects. One of those I spoke yesterday, I, I talked yesterday at the Python Dev Room about a uh, compactor for Postgres in cloud without the use of extensions. It's an interesting project. Another one is a replication tool from MySQL to Postgres. So it can help you to uh, escape MySQL if you are using it. And the last one is LinkedIn. So today we are talking about RTFM. Anybody knows what RTFM means, right? So the F, read the F manual. What the F stands for? Fantastic, fabulous, funny, fancy. Well, not exactly. E I'm not speaking that word now. Even because it's in live streaming, I don't like to, to swear in, in, live, in live streaming, but that's it. So uh, what is the uh, talk about? Telling stories of people that didn't do the RTFM and caused issues. So issues, disasters. So like any other disaster, I decide to put DEFCON levels like war games. So we have disaster of DEFCON 5, just a startling noise, the DBA is vaguely impressed, so well, something happened. The second level, DEFCON 4, tripping over feet, DBA alarmed, oh, something wrong is happening. And earthquake for DEFCON 3, jumping on the seat, and I bl believe me, uh, uh, having an earthquake under your seat is, is something very, very startling. I live in a quite se seismic uh, area of Italy, so uh, sometimes we, uh, we, we get this sort of emotions. Uh, DEFCON 2, asteroid dropping from the sky, DBA freaking out, and then the DEFCON 1, Daleks, Daleks invading the Earth, DBA going berserk. It happened to me going berserk, <laughs> swearing all around the office. <laughs> then we have the Dramatis Persona, 
still from war games. This is the Professor Falken, myself, old, ugly, quite cynical, and he's the perfect incarnation of the DBA, right? And the others, David Lightman, uh, young, reckless, very, very smart, and we idea that can cause the third world war if they, they are not uh, careful. So, table of contents. We have three stories and a wrap up to uh, discuss about what we've seen. The battle did it, emergency shutdown and cast a spell. Three stories of three RTFM that never happened and what caused and how they were fixed by myself. So let's start with the battle did it, DEFCON 4, not a big deal, caused by the others. Let's see the context. We had that was back in 2013. It was Postgres 9.1, still the old PGX log, not too much about monitoring, there were no fancy things. And we had this system with one very expensive Fusion IO cards. The, uh, at that time, they were pioneering the, uh, the, the disks in PCI Express. They were massively expensive. Uh, this system worked quite nice, uh, but he had this strange table, we used it as a working queue, so some records, all the records were picked in some way, and these records were used for processing some stuff in other places. This table had just 100 million rows, not so big in my opinion, quite big for that time, now it's, it's getting medium size for, for, the, for the size that we are using now. Uh, and this table had two timestamp fields. These two timestamp fields were updated twice, one for the start and one for the end of the processing. For each row, and each row was 160 bytes in average length. Uh, now, anybody knows the MVCC, how it works? In Postgres, there's no update. So this thing was inserting twice these rows every time and each row were processed. And this table had indices, so the, to the rows changed pages and the indices started bloating. And also there were the primary key onto integer fields. So the problem wasn't exactly the bloat. The table coped quite well with the performance, but the problem was the SSD. On SSD, we have limited writes. <laughs> And writing a lot of stuff on this SSD, even with the round robin for the blocks, caused a massive exhaustion of the writes. That was the I.O. just on the PGX log. Uh, thanks goodness it was on rotating disk, otherwise it will be much, much worse. And the data files were it even harder in this thing. So the table was rewritten every day. Every day this table got new blocks and the rows started accumulating inside it. The dead rows and out of vacuum started every six hours flushing more, more blocks on the disk, so consuming even more the, uh, the writes on this uh, Fusion I.O. And in just eight months, the available write dropped for 80% to 44%. Just eight months left before the Doomsday. And the Doomsday, in SSD world, it means disk in read-only mode. At some point, they just stopped accepting rights. Daleks coming down to invade the Earth. So how was fixed this thing? Well, the primary key, I redesigned slightly this thing. I didn't touch the existing table because it was so uh, deeply coupled with the rest of the things. So I could not change this thing. But I created a new table aggregating the fields of the primary key. The first field has common value, and the second field, uh, use it as a grouping key. Use it to be stored inside an, an integer array. So, accessing from the first field and accessing the single pieces of the array, physical location of the array, I could access exactly the point inside the, the other table without rotating the rows inside the other table. And when the fix came in, the world generation rate dropped to 40 megabytes per second from 1.5 gigabytes. And this is the mooning graph of the writes available. This is the operation, the mad operation, and then we, we, when the fix came in, 
everything went flat. No more risk. I estimated that the remaining PB will last for at least 10 years at that writing rate. That was amazing. So how do you avoid this sort of situation? Uh, doing RTFM. And for RTFM, I can recommend you these two uh, links, MVCC slides and video from Bruce Mombian. I love Bruce's uh, presentations. Uh, go to his, his website, uh, is mombian.us. Watch it. It's something you will learn a lot of stuff. Every time I visit, I, I come to the conference and there's a talk with, uh, from Bruce, it's something like BAM for me. The, my, my brain explodes every time. So watch this video. It will explain very, very clearly how the MVCC works and how you can avoid the, uh, the risk of exhausting your rights, but also reducing the I.O. So reduced I.O. It means having a more efficient caching, more efficient uh, database, and more responsive uh, working uh, for you. This is the first story. This was the first story. So let's move to the next one. That was me, and I caused the DEFCON 1 <laughs> situation. Emergency shutdown. That was an amazing discovery. Uh, by the way, uh, this story, uh, um, tomorrow on my blog it will appear, the, uh, the blog post about this story with all the explanation. So uh, if you look at the, at the blog tomorrow, uh, you will find the... Uh, even better described uh, about what we uh, I found about this this experience in this experience. So, context: virtual machine that was in 2016, 2017, probably Postgres 9.6, virtual machine for business intelligence, fairly big database, 1.4 terabytes, real-time replica from MySQL to Postgres using my tool PG Chameleon. Uh, this tool can r first reads the rows from MySQL, stores into Postgres, and then use this information for generate the DDL and replay against Postgres. And how this is done? Through a PLPGSQL function, uh, replays the data and also manage all the error that can appear during the replay. So you can exclude tables, you can, you can do some interesting stuff. So everything works very, very nicely. Monitoring not yet implemented, my bad. Uh, I was too busy on working on that thing. And yeah, everything went fine. People and analysts were very, very happy. They gave me this T-shirt uh, as a gift for bringing Postgres in place on MySQL. And the day started normally. And then I heard screams, people not running any more queries with the horrible errors. And, but the database was up as usual. But the nightly maintenance failed, and I got this message in the log. Database is not accepting commands to avoid wraparound data loss in database analytics. This was the f only shutdown emergency mode I even w had in my career starting from 2006 on Postgres, and I was the cause of that. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> so I uh, don't know if you have even read this part of the manual on the, on the Postgres.org website, uh, but it's quite scary. Uh, what happens when, uh, when these messages appear? It means you, are, you have at least one tuple uh, at just Less, at less than one million rows from disappearing from the database, which is in, inside the database architecture. Uh, the rows are compared against numbers, and these numbers are just 32 bytes uh, integers. So they, 32 bits integers. So they wrap every four billion times, every four billion numbers. They start from the uh, number one and re, uh, restart the sequence. And everything bigger, is in the future, everything smaller is in the past. So as soon as it wraps around, everything becomes in the future. Postgres have a very clever way to avoid this scenario, but this often, the number of slots available, two billion in the future, two billion in the past, whatever is the number. And that is the reason why. So you have to run vacuum or out of vacuum to perform the operation of freezing the rows before this problem happens. Uh, so 
what caused that? Insufficient auto vacuum processes. Databases should have the auto vacuum on because auto vacuum does a lot of stuff and in particular can save you from having these sort of issues. But tuning the auto vacuum is very important because fewer auto vacuum on databases with a lot of updates may not pick the correct table for doing the auto vacuum when it's needed or when the auto vacuum for to prevent uh, XID wraparound can start too late for saving your database. And the other reason was myself. There is an apparently, I haven't found any reference about this behavior, an apparently undocument, undocumented behavior of the PLPG SQL functions. Uh, you know, the functions in Postgres are single transaction. When you run this function, when it finishes and commits, you get all the changes. Otherwise, you roll back everything. So they consume just one XID, right? Well, not really, because if you have an exception inside your function's body, and inside this exception there is an IDML, insert delete update, each time this DML is executed, consumes an extra XID. So my function for replaying stuff in PG Chameleon <coughs> was consuming 100,000 XID every time completed a batch to replay. And it replays exactly the DML for loop in an exception, consuming an XID. So I will show you uh, slightly more in detail this thing. So we create a table t-test with the ID integer, no foreign keys, no primary key, just a simple table, just the data. Then we have this function that fn loop with no exception. We declare this number and then we loop over this number from 1 to 1000 and we do an insert for each loop, okay? Then we have the same function, but inside the loop we have a begin exception, when others, then null. So if there's any error, just a function. Uh, skip the, uh, the, uh, the loop, uh, the, uh, the, the iteration, and continue. So uh, you have little sense in this context, but it, it can be useful to have the exception. So let's check with this database. I vacuum freeze my database, starting from three. I run a three queries before doing that. Select that name, age of that frozen XID from PG database where that name is equal test. So it returns the name and the age of the oldest transaction ID inside the database that is not frozen. <coughs> then I execute the FN loop no exception and after that my XID increased by one. So jump from three to one as expected. Now let's do the same with the other function age starting five after this query. Then I run this thing and the age jumps to 1006. So 1000 XID, one per each DML inside the for loop, plus the XID for the function itself. So how this was fixed? <laughs> Uh, this is uh, the emergency handling in the, in the database universe. You forget everything, you silence everything, and first thing, silence Slack, because we, people were screaming in uh, uh, private message, getting a lot of noise from Slack. So silence Slack, move into an empty uh, meeting room, put the message, I know, on the, <laughs> on the screen, on the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then start the cluster in single user mode is an amazing experience. I don't want to repeat anymore. <laughs> uh, if you have ever worked with PSQL, PSQL is fantastic. Uh, line completion, backslash commands. No, the single user mode is something horrible. You get a lot of stuff, a lot of noise, and you have nothing to do. You have to type every single letter of your query. You can do probably, maybe, maybe the Copy, cut, copy and paste may, maybe may work, but there's no way for loading files in external, so mm, I think it, it should be improved, this, the, the, this interface. So or is, uh, it should be kept that way, so people are so scared that they will try to avoid at any, <laughs> at any cost. So start the cluster in uh, single user mode, get the aging tables, and vacuum the aging tables and do a post-mortem analysis. So uh, analyze what went wrong, who was the, uh, uh, the cause of that thing, myself, 
And so, yeah. And this is a very useful query for getting the adjoint tables. I think this one, not sure if I derive it from the PostgreSQL wiki, which is a Oh, is a is an amazing source of information, or from the uh, PG Check Postgres, the um, the Bucardo Perl script for uh, for Nagios. But this is very useful because taking into account the frozen XID, the real frozen XID for the table, but also for the associated toast table, because you can get a table that looks nice, but if maybe it's the associated toast table is aging. So this query gets everything outside for any relation table or any materialized view, because do not forget about the materialized views. Materialized views are basically tables that follow the same rules. And when you get this, maybe something more fancy can be done, something like using format for building up the vacuum statements straight from that thing, dumping on a file. This is a very Oracle style for <laughs> using, I'm still using that, uh, that approach. So RTFM, what uh, I missed in this thing? Well, I wasn't able to find this case on the documentation. Uh, if you look on the uh, exception part, trapping exception on um, the Postgres uh, online manual, it says, yes, use exception with caution because they are more expensive compared to the function with no exception blocks. But the, it says nothing about the uh, exhaustion of the uh, transaction XID. So, it may be useful to add the warning. Uh, I will add by myself. I will submit uh, a uh, patch for the Postgres manual. I, I need help for building up the uh, the entire thing. So uh, how to build the, the documentation. I, I tried and I failed. So I need to learn. And that's the, the amazing part of this, this job. You learn constantly. So cast the spell. That is another amazing story. Uh, let me recap the day, uh, 2012. 2012, I started the second job in the UK uh, on uh, PostgreSQL, uh, very large database. And that time there were a mixed environment between Postgres 9.0, Postgres 9.1. Then I upgraded everything to Postgres 9.2. It was an interesting experience. So we had this large database, at that time it was large, two terabytes, uh, still Fusion I.O. on that thing. Uh, on that database, uh, I remember I, I joked about playing Tetris with the, with the tables and table spaces, because periodically the active uh, partition were moved on to Fusion I.O., but there was no, not enough space for keeping everything onto it. So the expiring partition were put on rotating disk. And every year, and every month, there was this, uh, this movement of Tetris, so playing a lot about the, with the space. Uh, and they had a, an horrible design. And for horrible, I mean table with few fields, one uh, edge store field, uh, and Java mediated the uh, structure straight into the edge store field. And that was causing a lot of problem uh, until the day I removed that thing and we ended with a 91 field table, quite big. And we had, it was one of my first assignments doing performance tuning on a query uh, that retrieved just 150 rows in six minutes. Okay, the storage were big, but that was absolutely insane. The storage, it was in SSD, it was in lightning fast, so there was something else. Uh, the we had this super expensive Fusion IO storage and super expensive CPU and memory state of the art in 2013. Uh, we are talking about a 35,000 pound, pounds server, bare metal, no virtualization, everything installed uh, on that thing. And they performed horribly. So checking the execution plan, well, first check the statistics are okay, then check the execution plan. The execution plan was absolutely okay, no problem at all. Uh, there were well, there were a subquery, 
we wrong joint criteria, try to fix it, but no success in slowing, in, in improving the speed of this, uh, this query. And, but at some point I did a select star from the same query, and the query completed in seconds, not minutes. Oh, something started alarming, there's some, some, some bells started ringing in my head. So, well, what went wrong in this thing? Uh, you know, Edge Store is not so complex. It's some sort of grandfather of the JSON. So is uh, every time, whatever you store inside the key, you get the text data type. So if you are a strongly typed uh, language on the other side, you have to do a cast for this data type. And the developers, instead of doing classic cast, colon, colon, uh, uh, data type, decide to write a PLPG SQL function for each type they wanted to cast. <laughs> you, you are reaching the point, you, you are seeing what, what's the problem. <laughs> so we add this function, yeah, this is a pseudo function, it's not exactly the same, I don't remember how it was, so I rewritten trying to follow the same, uh, the same idea. So they uh, written cast to integer, cast to text, why? <laughs> uh, cast to float, cast to uh, some to timestamp. They pass it the key name and the metadata store, the meta store, as a parameter. So they use this information to retrieve the information and doing a cast straight into the return uh, row. <laughs> it was an amazing idea, right? <laughs> well, and we had this sort of select. Uh, count another 80, uh, 80 col meta columns written in this way. So every time, oh, but it was also worse. This, this is the optimized version. They made this thing at lower level of the subselect when the subselect uh, processed hundreds and hundreds of, of rows before doing the final filter for the 160 rows. So all time, every time you have something like that inside your select list, the uh, hstore.so, the shared object, get accessed and the transformation from the hstore stored on disk, which is basically text separated by pipes with an either, get transformed in memory, transformed in datum, the library does the magic. There's a lot of context changes between the memory, the main memory, and the memory used for the, uh, the shared object. Then this thing it gets passed through Postgres. Postgres does the final cast because he has to cast into the, uh, the primitive type. And finally, the shared object gets discarded. And this is just for this one. Then he starts again, and again, and again. Count for every single row. It was even faster, six minutes. It was incredibly faster, in my opinion. So how this was fixed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, no, our method is OK. You are wrong. You don't understand all the implication we are using, all the structures we are using. Man, I want to do a simple cast. Well, there was another function I don't mention in that at this point, which made a slightly different thing. Converted to text and then performed an internal aggregation in a different way array aggregation works. Uh, not skipping the nulls. They kept the nulls inside the aggregated array. They've written uh, some sort of different aggregation function just for keeping in the nulls inside the, the array. I don't know why, why people want to keep nulls, which are basically nothing, but they, they made it in this way. And that was the only function left in place because um, there was no way to, to change in another way. Well, at that time, I didn't know too much about the custom aggregations. Custom aggregation is are something amazing in Postgres. Have a look. There's a blog post about from Josh Berkus and on my blog uh, how to build up a custom aggregate. You can do fantastic thing with this thing. So it started with the argument. When the argument finished, probably a couple of weeks, <laughs> we I finally uh, I've been authorized to uh, rewrite the join, 
and get rid of all the select list and the query drop to 10 seconds. It will be faster probably if I will be able to remove also the, uh, the, final, uh, the final piece of, uh, of code. So live long and prosper. And what to do for RTFM? This is a very complex, uh, this is a complex answer because uh, working with Postgres is not simple. It seems simple, but Postgres is an incredibly complex uh, environment, an incredibly complex uh, product. Uh, the first thing to do is read the docs, so get into the concept of what is a PLPG SQL function. Maybe if they uh, would have used the SQL function, the damage wouldn't, wouldn't be too big, because the SQL functions are built in in Postgres and they get in line, so it would be much, much better. Uh, so use the, P, the procedural language only if you need the procedural language. Uh, I also seen uh, procedural language used for transforming data uh, in ETL procedures. Uh, this is the wrong way to do it because the performance is completely screwed. Uh, the best way to do this sort of stuff is to do insert select. So if you can stick on the pure SQL as much as possible, you will get the best performance and the less churn in memory caused by context changes. Uh, if you have some idea, before starting implementing it uh, and maybe wasting your time, ask the community. Uh, we have a lot of channels for doing that. Uh, of course, mailing lists, they are very, very nice. IRC uh, on the Postgres channel, on Freenode, there is a Slack application and there is the Telegram uh, channel if you use Telegram. And in this room there are two admins, me and Janine on the bottom. So we are the admin of the Telegram chat. So, and the last thing, uh, if you can get it, because it's, quite, it's still quite difficult to find a uh, pure DBA or Postgres expert at DBA level, hire a DBA. Uh, I, and more important, listen to the DBA. <laughs> Is a, uh, do, do not. Do, uh, d d I remember there was um, a, a T-shirt called with written, "I am a DBA." Can we start assuming that I am always right, and then we can continue discussing? <laughs> Well, it's not that true because DBA make a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes. I'm here for uh, test as a testimony about that. So, but it's important if a DBA comes in and asks for uh, some optimi optimization, is because not just because he's arguing for something uh, abstract. It's because there's there's a real problem, even if the problem is not yet there. Uh, DBA usually look forward to the problems. So, uh, I've been incredibly fast, so uh, let's go for the wrap up. Uh, the, uh, well, I can, I can explain how to cook a carbonara in the, <laughs> the extra time if you want. <laughs> Seriously, I, do you remember? Uh, I presented uh, in London. Uh, yeah? How much cream? No cream. <laughs> no cream. <laughs> <laughs> so wrap up about this thing, greetings, but yeah, the best, the only way in the move is not to play, not really true. Uh, RTFM, uh, reading the manual uh, is important, but it's also uh, very important to uh, read between uh, the lines of the manual. And in Postgres in particular, we have an amazing opportunity. Uh, other databases, closed source databases, or the databases starting with O, uh, do not allow the users and the DBA to access what's happening, do, to know exactly what's happening inside the database. They even wrap and obs obfuscate the procedures. In Postgres, we have access to the source code. Uh, I like to think about the Postgres source code as a super poetry written in C. This is what I've written on my book because the, uh, uh, is, is, it, is it poetry? You can read, you, you don't have to be a C developer for understanding what's going on in Postgres. First, because the README is, they are amazing, every single section the README will explain a lot of stuff. So if you are in doubt, 
check inside the source code. And if you are a C developer, you will be massively advantaged about the, uh, what's going on inside your database. And maybe you will build up something uh, more and more efficient. So basically doing RTFM, but at, uh, with steroids maybe. I think we are finished. And yeah, this is the license, and that's all, folks. I've been 16 minutes uh, earlier, sorry, been very, very fast. And there are any questions? Yeah, and for the people who ask questions, where, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, with your uh, third uh, story, mm -hmm. if I got it right, so when you wrap your query in a, uh, when you turn it into a sub query, it become faster. Why? Uh, no, it become uh, no. The uh, sorry, I, um, I I didn't explain clearly. Uh, basically, the uh, cast functions, the PL function, were inside the subquery. So the query was even slower because the subquery uh, process more rows than the upper query. If inside your subquery you have a filter, this subquery first filters these rows and then returns these rows. But when you process these rows at where condition, also they get uh, passed through the select list and then discarded. Meanwhile, they got uh, filtered. So moving all the expensive computation part outside at the maximum level, according with the eventual aggregations or anything, uh, it can improve massively your query. Uh, I remember there were a a query with a format function, uh, a two char function at lower level. Just moving this two char to the upper level, it changes completely the query. Drop it from seconds to milliseconds. Uh, the first example, uh, sorry? Okay, can, can you repeat the question? Uh, sir, what was the fix applied in the first example? Oh, okay, the, the first example, the, uh, the butler, the butler, the, uh, the exhausting of the rights, right, okay. So um, what I did, uh, I changed the, the logic inside this table. So the original table had two timestamp fields. So the processor updated the first timestamp and said starting the, uh, the processing. And then when he finished, updated the second si timestamp to say, OK, I'm finished. And then this was used in a select ordered by, by timestamp to get the uh, row not yet processed. So this was causing a lot of writes. What I did, I used the primary key, which was a composite key by two values, to aggregate this information inside a one common value and an integer array. Uh, are you familiar with the arrays in Postgres? So the integer array is positional. So pointing the single element, I could access the exact value of the primary key. And using this primary key, without updating anything, I will just uh, look on the, on the row and say, OK, this is the row I want to update. And then another table. Uh, changed this counter, moved my pointer inside this, this array without touching anything. And then I had the periodic uh, re-aggregator which ran every day for collecting new rows inside this big queue. So one of the uh, ways to improve the performance in Postgres when you deal with queues, keep all the uh, updated fields in one table, in one separated table. Because in Postgres, uh, you generate new rows every time you, f you, you perform an update. If you, if you have a row 160 bytes and you update the Boolean, you generate 160 bytes, not just the Boolean. So this is very important to understand for avoiding this sort of stuff, but more important, avoiding bloat on table and bloat on indices. Any other questions? Well, that was interesting because. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, okay, so yeah, I forgot about the. Uh, <laughs> there's no. Uh, okay, so uh, why out of vacuum didn't work in my uh, second example? Uh, 
uh, that was uh, a problem caused by the number of autovacuum workers. So there were too many tables that needed to be vacuumed, and there were too few autovacuum workers. So autovacuum spent a lot of time on the same tables without picking the, uh, the tables that with the data edging. Okay, the why the XID, uh, why the exception adds uh, the XID to the uh, to, to the computer of the uh, the function. Uh, well, uh, I can suppose I spoke with a friend of mine, which is a SQL developer, C developer is also. I, I think he also contributed to some part of Postgres. So um, and. You see, he, he may be because this thing, uh, because he needs to be uh, rolled back inside the transaction, needs an extra transaction for managing the rollback at uh, data area level, so inside the PGX Act, where the, uh, the commit status is. So you basically get one XID, then all the XID that they get uh, committed in a virtual way, way meanwhile the function uh, progress. And then when the function commits, everything gets committed and everything becomes visible. So this can be a structural uh, reason. So is, is a choice made for, be, for having possible the rollback, the, the exception to cancel and rollback the, uh, the pieces executed. Okay, asking about Postgres, the, yeah, the stories were all related to Postgres 9, so it's back in the past, so it's a, it's a flash from the past about this thing. Uh, and in Postgres 12, probably you will get the same results, because the, uh, it, the, it didn't change too much. We still have the MVCC, we still have Auto Vacuum, which works in the same way like in the version 9, and also the PLPG SQL function works in the same way like the uh, like it was in the nine. I think in nine point six, starting in nine point six, we are faster for uh, running auto vacuum when auto vacuum starts because of the um, XID wraparound. Oh, so it's it's so auto vacuum is prioritized over the XID wraparound. So probably we don't the, the whole table. Uh, okay. Just just the, uh, the, t the the rows, so it will be much more effective. So probably the second story wouldn't happen with the with the newer version. Okay, cool. Thanks for the information. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you know if uh, save point would also uh, consume an SID? Uh, I think so. I think uh, the oh, oh yes, uh, uh, is asking if the uh, save point inside the transaction will consume uh, an XID. Uh, I I want to try, but I think it may, uh, because the uh, in any case is is managed at XID level. So yeah, uh, but I will try. I will try. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned ways of uh, getting help from the community, like the mailing list, even the Telegram chat and everything. But when you figure out that there is something that is missing from the documentation, how do you contribute to help the documentation to be better? Well, this is a very good question. So uh, if you find that there is a missing uh, part of the, in the documentation, how do you contribute? Well, uh, I will start with uh, following the, listening to the talk of Leticia. Uh, demystifying contributing PostgreSQL, which is a very interesting talk. So, two years ago. First, so it should be still online. Yeah. To, uh, so, it's, it's an amazing talk for uh, that can drive to uh, contribute to the Postgres community and how to write the, the documentation. So, I will just, and this is probably what I will do, uh, submit a patch for adding this information to the alert box on the Postgres uh, documentation. So. Uh, filling up the uh, the missing parts. Yes. Yeah. I have a question there. <laughs> In the first example, when you made the second table with the array, mm -hmm. is that a good way of handling queues in general in PostgreSQL, or is that just working around 
Okay, uh, okay. Uh, the, the question is if using the arrays for handling the queues is the best way to manage uh, queues in Postgres and the answer is yes, definitely, because the arrays, in particular if you do not update the array um, uh, ordering, uh, you will have a complete static table and you can just use a pointer, an integer, for pointing the element inside the array. So you will limit the updates just to that tiny little integer. So yes. Okay, so from the question here. As a backend developer, I often use a pause to like, just uh, do queries, and uh, when I don't know what to do, I go see the manual. But there's never some place where I can actually understand how pause really works internally. Where can I find this, uh, this information? Can I do product placement? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there are there are a lot. Of, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, the question is um, where to find uh, how Postgres works internally. So uh, I will start from the um, manual from the open source code. From the source code, is it, this is where I learned how Postgres works internally. Uh, I've written a book. <laughs> about this thing. Uh, it will come out next week. But the, uh, there are a lot of information about this thing. So I will start from the readme inside, I don't remember, is the tuple, storage tuple or something like that, or ePage.h. There is the uh, readme with all the discussion and how the entire thing works. But uh, I will start from that thing. Read from the source and you will never get wrong. Oh, you're mentioning, uh, you, uh, you ask it. And then you will see, okay, you're using this index or you're doing a sequential scan. Oh, you, you mean, oh, you, sorry, you, you, uh, you okay, I, I misunderstood your question. Oh, I, uh, you had the ah, ah, you want to know the internal? Oh, yeah, I oh. Want to know uh, yeah okay, source code, source code. No, you can't, you can't get wrong. But if you want to know, what your query is doing, use explain or explain analyze to display the execution plan and see, uh, you will see what the query is doing. Yeah, from that point you continue with the source code. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, cool. thank you very much. Thank you very much.